Welcome to Gate Crashers, a podcast dedicated to kicking open the door to your next favorite thing. Our mission, our creed, and our code is this, to make all things nerdy more approachable and accessible for everyone. We want you to find a universe that you're going to fall in love with. My name is Dan, my pronouns are he, him, and today I'm chatting with Stephanie Williams, who's currently working on Nubia and the Amazons. She's been doing a lot of freelance writing. Um, you can see some of the work on DC Comics' official site. Um, they also have a couple web comics with Parenthood Activate. BWIT, which we'll talk about later, and Living Heroes. How are you? I'm doing great, Dan. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm always excited when I can do that in one go and not mess anything up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I, I had was, that superpower. Yeah, it's um, it's been th- three years. I'm only just getting the hang of it, so it's fine. <laughs> Sometimes they forget our website, so you'll see at the end. <laughs> so... Um, how have you been? I, you've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, I have been well overall, just a little overwhelmed at times, but nothing bad. Just it's a lot to process. Um, this is like a really big thing. Um, and I've been trying to not think of it that way. So I don't freak myself out, but <laughs> yeah. it's, um, it's an entire whole, you know, comic book with a character that, um, has somehow managed to garner the respect and love that she has without the comic history to go with it. Yeah. I, I was, I, I've read your article about your feelings on it a couple of times, just because I do try to read most of your stuff, like your freelance writing, because it's very, always makes me laugh. And also I'm, I'm so happy for your success and I'm so happy you're doing all this stuff, but I'm also happy that you still have time to make memes because that's how you and I met. So yes, <laughs> as, long, as long as those keep coming out, I'll be, I'll be right as rain. So before we get into the, the easy questions about the book and all that kind of stuff, I do want to start with a pretty hard hitting question. Um, we're known as hard hitting journalisms in this small comic book pool. What's your favorite sandwich? Ooh, my favorite sandwich um, currently is one at Panera. It is um, the turkey bacon Bravo sandwich. You know what? That's actually my favorite at Panera as well. Yeah. Big fan of that one. Um, so, as you, does Italian ahead. beef count? Yeah, you know what? Italian beef counts yeah. as a sandwich. Yeah. Um, I miss living in Chicago because I miss Portillo's. There are none in North Carolina. So if anybody who is in charge of franchising Portillo's and you're <laughs> listening to this, I am begging you to put one in North Carolina. I will drive to Raleigh. I don't care. (laughs) Just put it somewhere here. So I actually, I want to talk about Portillo's because I actually just went there for the first time a couple months ago. I went out to Chicago for an AEW show. Yeah. Um, I'm going back for C2E2. Uh, They dipped that whole sandwich. It is is glorious. Um, It's messy. It's incredible. Yeah, it's wet. It's a wet sandwich. Yeah. (laughs) But it's a delicious wet sandwich. Um, It's the only time that the word moist does not make my ears burn. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see that. I got it. I I was not, when they said dipped, I was like, oh yeah, dipped. Like, I know (laughs) sandwiches, but I wasn't expecting to get this, this. And I was like, oh, oh. And like, I wanted to go to sleep afterwards, but I had to catch a flight. So it was, um, that was, I know that was rough. Um, O'Hare or Midway? Oh, hair. Ooh. Yeah, I airports are probably the worst part of traveling for me. Not the flying, just airports. Mm-hmm. The whole thing gives me anxiety. So at least I was full of that and a hot dog. So it was a good day. Oh, yeah. I remember um, smuggling some Thai beef back from um, a work meeting that I had. We had to fly out to <laughs> Chicago. We were only there for the day and they had Portillo's cater. And they had like a bunch of sandwiches left over. So I was like, oh. Well, guess who's bought an extra bag with them? Um, so that was fun getting that through uh, TSA. It was oh, worth it. TSA. <laughs> yes. Excuse me, why is your bag tripping? Oh, just just ignore it. Let it go through the thing. <laughs> right. Like, like ma'am, um, why are these? Did, do you have eight Italian beefs in here? Um, is everything okay? Your, <laughs> <laughs> you good? Like, do you want to talk about it? Um, you're in North Carolina now. Are you a big barbecue fan? I am a big barbecue fan. Um, and even being from the Chicago area, um, 
that also had me as a barbecue fan, but it's a little different because up there, um, it's the rib tips um, is the thing that you normally would mm. get, but down here you get the whole slab. So yeah. um, I've been enjoying that. Yeah, my girl, my partner is from um, North Carolina, so I've got to experience that too. Um, big fan. Yes. I'm in Philly, so I have Ooh. my own brand of stuff. Absolutely, a tasty stuff too. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's a it's a problem. <laughs> So, how does it feel now that your book is out in the world? Like, did issue one is out as we're speaking right now? Um, I've read issue two, incredible, not out yet. Oh, but- really? Wow. Do you know what? Thank you for telling me that because I've been stressing. So, to answer your question, as I've interrupted you, <laughs> uh, because I had, um, so it felt great relief, which lasted all of, I don't know, three days because then I remembered issue two (laughs) has to come out and what are folks going to think of that? So um, thank you for uh, saying that, but overwhelmed, uh, grateful, thankful. Um, You know, it's a, it's a little surreal (laughs) being on the other side, other side of thing, things as like as much of a fan I am of the stuff that I'm actually writing now. So um, I don't know, like to kind of have folks like to see folks in real time react to something that you've written uh, and pick up on some of the things that you hope that they would pick up on uh, and point out some stuff that, you know, maybe you didn't necessarily mean the interpretation that way, but it still works because it's all still related. So that's just that's just, I'm, I'm excited to see other folks excited and going up and like making memes or just sharing the artwork uh, <laughs> online. Like, I mean, why else? I got into comics because I wanted to be able to make memes of my own things. <laughs> How does it? So you mentioned this before, like Nubia hasn't gotten hasn't gotten a ton not screen time, like page time. There was like a huge, when I was reading your article, I learned there's like a huge gap from mm-hmm. when she appears and when she appears next. How does it feel to like be one of the people expanding that character? Um, exhilarating and then also tremendously burdensome in the way that uh, because Nubia has meant so much to folks um, and a lot of that has come from what they make up of her in their minds from just going off the little bit that she's been in the books, you know, your, your best horror director would tell you that you can't pe- you just can't compete with someone's um, imagination. That's why some of the best jump scares or things that you don't see those movies are so memorable because of what you envision happening, even though the camera panned away. So just taking all of that in consideration, uh, again, like exhilarate, exhilarating and scary at the same time, because um, I hope <laughs> that the story that, you know, we're currently writing measures up in some way to uh, what folks have um, wanted Nubia to be and have built her up to be, or if anything that uh, we've paid Like, it's very clear in our writing um, that it's done in love and that we care for this character and want to um, give her, like, this definitive story in the DCU where you get to, I don't know, like, when you think of Nubia, you think of Nubia. You're not thinking of anyone Mm -hmm. else um, because she's kind of had to survive off of or survive being in the shadow of Diana. Yeah, and... People, yeah, like I've seen the comparison, like the Black Wonder Woman, things like that. But it's like, it's very exciting to have a character be able to get their own spotlight and be like, no, they're their own person mm-hmm. and things like that. So um, I've said it many times. I I am just a white guy. And I think it's very, very important that there are more characters out there for people to see themselves in. Like there are, there are more than enough people who look like me in comics. Like I don't need any more Hal Jordan's period actually don't even need him you but, know unless he's getting beat up yes uh yeah. <laughs> only how jordan is getting beat up um but you're getting the chance to with vita you're getting a chance to kind of really dive into this character and build out who she is because like it's a lot of it is there but a lot of it is 
you, you've you've basically said in these fan spaces and you knew how certain people have like certain reads of characters and that's kind of like the thing they go on because they haven't gotten enough page right. time. Mm-hmm. Now, for you going into this, what was important to you, like building out her personality and feelings? Um, were there any like certain personality traits or quirks you wanted to bring to this character to give her um, just a more, I don't know, <clears throat> kind of like gravity, like giving her more of her own space? Absolutely. So, um, you know, one of the things I did not want her to be perfect. Um, and that's something that you can kind of easily fall into uh, with a character like her because she is strong. She is fierce. Um, she's all of these things that, you know, when we think of Diana, but what is the fun in that? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that I really love that Colts did with his Black Panther run was he showed a T'Challa that does not have it all figured out. And also what, you know, the monarchy really means to the people of Wakanda um, and how some of those folks aren't all happy about them because they've kind of gotten left out. Um, you see like the the reach of the monarchy is just, it doesn't extend all the way as far as it should or its impact. So thinking of that and having um, kind of like a T'Challa, a Storm, these two Black characters where they are so powerful in their own way, sometimes, I don't know, like they read a little too perfect sometimes. Uh, I think one of the things that I've always enjoyed about uh, Storm was during Claremont's run, um, that time where she is questioning, um, am I a goddess? Do I want to be a goddess? Do I just want to be an X-Men? Like, is it okay for me to fail? Um, because a goddess is not supposed to do that. So keeping that in mind, um, my approach to Nubia was to, we already know she's these other great things. So what does she fear? Um, what does she love to do? Um, what what makes her angry? What, what, what would break her composure? Um, and for somebody who's been a champion of Dune's doorway for so long, after a while, that has to affect you, right? You are sequestered away from everyone else for most of the time. Um, you're down there just, you know, making sure nobody gets out the door. And if something does get out the door, then the only time you're really getting out and maybe getting a little PTO <laughs> is to go track down <laughs> whatever's escaped this door. So, um, you know, I want Nubia to feel like a character that is relatable and not just because, um, you know, if you're a Black woman, you can relate to just those just that identifier. No, like it, it needs to go beyond that. And it easily can, uh, because I mean, she has just become essentially like CEO of Themyscira. Um, so what does that look like? Because it's going to be different because Themyscira is, you know, not limited to the same types of, um, things we are here, but there has to be some type of friction because a utopia is never a utopia. Um, entirely because that all changes depending on the perspective. That's interesting to, well, <clears throat> so if it changes on based on perspective, what does Themyscira mean to you? So for a while, Themyscira to me felt like, um, like this, this haven for women, but um, sometimes limited in what that looked like. Um, it did not dawn on me until I went back and I got into George Perez's run and then going back to even further when Nubia first makes her appearance, like, man, I don't remember like the only difference between the Amazons being their hair color. Like I could have sworn that there was more diversity, but it really wasn't. Um, and you really don't start to see that until George Perez's run. So if this and so the Cavern of Souls comes into play and like if this is supposed to be an island where, um, you know, all women who are harmed um, in man's world get to come and be reborn again, um, then why does it not look a little bit more diverse than it currently is? So to me, um, that's a, I mean, it might be a utopia, but it's like, it's a, it's one that's got a little nice little gate around it and it just yeah. shouldn't be. Uh, so, and thinking of that also, Doom's doorway is there. 
<laughs> and if you think about it, like that is a whole, you know, uh, it was essentially like prison for uh, all these beings that the, the gods deem terrible. Uh, some of it is rightfully so and others I don't know, it might be a little murky. So what does that make the mascara more? It, does it become more of a, a, fr- a front for this, like a beautiful front and covering for this, you know, doom's door- doorway, which is below it? So that's kind of what I mean by perspective, because like for the women that are there, maybe it is, um, you know, paradise, but maybe it isn't all the way. Because um, the only way that it can really function as a, a utopia and paradise if some truths are maybe withheld sometimes i do want to talk a little bit more about the diversity on the island but the dooms the dooms doorway I, the thing you said about not everyone in there may it may be murky is it <clears throat> when people get put in there do you think it's based on the god's own judgment or more like is it just well, I, or is that something you want to explore? That's something I want to explore because um, to me, it'd be like, you know, based on the God's jez- uh, judgment. And as we know, <laughs> the gods are not invaluable. <laughs> so in that regard, um, again, like sometimes is it is it just sure? But in other instances, um, is that always the case? And then, you know, are you actually turning someone or a thing more into a, the monster that it was before it even entered that door? That door corrupts things. So how does that look on the outside and on the inside? Wow. The, the, were they monsters before they got in there or are they monsters after is such an interesting idea to play with. So I do, I would, you've also said in your piece about, um, Nubia and Themyscira and things like that, that the island before was kind of like what men thought it should look like. Mm-hmm. For you, what were the sources of inspiration for how the island should look now? And I know it's a lot of the artists, but like, what did you want to bring to it? Uh, what I saw when I went outside. Uh, what I see when, um, you know, I log on uh, to Twitter and I'm in different spaces. Um, I just wanted it to, again, if this Island, unfortunately, is populated by women who have been harmed in man's world, then, you know, statistically, we kind of know what that looks like. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's important that the island more so reflects that than it has in the past. Um, And that it's just, it's a, everybody deserves, um, you know, a a second chance um, to be on this island to experience a life unhindered by the things that they were in man's world. And that also is interesting because like, what does that look for them? And I would imagine that it would be a much cooler journey um, if not everybody looked the same. Yeah. And I, I love the idea of making it look like the world around you. Um, And like, I see a lot of things where the character Baya, who was um, introduced by you and Vita, is the first trans woman on the mascara, and that was incredible to me. But like, I saw a lot of articles about it, like about how it's it's good, but it's like that's how it should be. Like mm-hmm. that's how the world is, and that's how it should be in general. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, even if that character, like even if you, the team doesn't have plans to use them in the future. Do you think it's important to put these characters in the world just to f- for future creators to use, such as Nubia is now finding a place of prominence after not getting her well-deserved place in the DCU for so long? Absolutely. Um, and that was one of the things. So I am someone who really grab- gravitated towards a lot of um, subtext uh, whenever it reads stuff, mm-hmm. especially Bronze Age, um, early 90s, where Comics Code Authority was shutting things down. So creators had to yeah. be a little bit more creative with the way that they um, kind of wanted to tell the stories that they did. Um, and queer subtext is my favorite genre. I'm just going to call it a drama because that's how it feels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and for and for reasons. Um, so in knowing that and understanding how, yes, that is great if that is there. And it could be even better if that character um, exists um, definitively, like in, in the text, mm-hmm. not in the subtext. So um the DC office was extremely supportive. The Wonder Woman office editors, they were all very supportive um, because 
the well of souls um in the same way that i felt uh george perez used the cavern of souls when in his run to introduce diversity to the mascara okay great idea we're bringing it back let's push it forward for 2021 and even though um in my heart i feel as though trans amazons have always existed on the mascara Mm -hmm. let's make it because i know how fanboys are because yeah. they like to say, yes. hey, go to the canon. Go. I'm like, okay, well, then let's make it canon. Because it's not enough to just be for it to be a subtext thing. If, since we were, you know, had the permission to go ahead and make it a thing, make it a thing. Hell, I was willing to make it a thing and then apologize for it later. Yeah. With that, like, I... So personally, I have catered my online spaces to not see, neg- like, the negative things about it, but... I don't know if you get to do that because you are the person writing the book yeah. with introducing this character. Have you found the reaction to be more positive than you thought it'd be? Or have you had to deal with some of, um, you know, fan um, So it definitely has been way more positive um, than I thought it would be. And not that I didn't think it would be positive, but, um, you know, my greatest fear was I didn't at all want anyone to feel as though we were overstepping or any of mm-hmm. that. Um, we just really wanted to make sure that, like, since we had the opportunity as long as we're introducing, reintroducing Nubia to the DCU, um, we are also introducing new Amazons and kind of reintroducing life on Themyscira and what it means to be at Amazons to new readers and old readers alike. So um, in all of that, I just wanted, I just hope that the love, care and attentiveness, attentiveness that came, that has gone into the story and has gone into Bia, but jump off the page. And essentially it has, um, because when I saw folks already, you know, assuming or calling it out that um, Bia was trans and that there was already a lot of trans allegory throughout the book anyway, I was like, wow, so like y'all get you all see this so that means that we've done a um you know a, a respectful enough job that you have wanted to receive this and claim it so it made me all the more happy and honestly worth it you know people are going to be asshats uh no matter yeah. what and I, you can't let that stop you. I can't let that stop you. I mean, <laughs> it would be a half of where I've been if I did. Because someone has always had something to say. So, um, or not wanted me in a space. So, have I seen some of the nasty stuff? Absolutely. Some of it just can't be avoided. But mm-hmm. you know what? Um, so what? Uh, because yeah. whatever they have to say will not you know, if it only matters if it's paid attention to and it doesn't go on. DC didn't pay them to write anything. They paid me. So. Yeah, that's I, and stuff like that. Like, even if it's small, like if even it's a panel, my friends get to see themselves in books like mm-hmm. it's the, and k- kids get like people who like younger people get to see themselves and their heroes. And it just means so much. It does. So knowing that it it's it's. Again, uh, you we both are we love the subtext of this kind of stuff, and it it's very powerful when you have it hit so quickly. Like people knew, so it means like you're you did it right. Now, um, we've talked about the World Souls a couple of times, um, and I, I should have asked you all these names beforehand, <laughs> so it don't sound goofy. Ma- Ma- Magala, uh, Magala, Magala. Magala. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would have never gotten that. No, it's okay. Um, so there was a page in issue one for the Well of Souls and Magala, which kind of explained them, which is wonderful. Like, very, very into pages kind of giving these brief explanations of what things are. Are these guides to the Mascara pages going to be in other issues as well? Absolutely. And you can thank uh, Jonathan Hickman for that because I enjoyed <laughs> <laughs> uh, Donna Vex, Howard's of X and all of that. Um, yep. And I thought that those pages were um, great. And that's not the first time like information pages have popped up in yeah. comics, but they really made it a theme. So I'm like, yeah, duh. this is the way that you kind of um, avoid being really exposition heavy in the, you know, the actual comic script. And you could just put a little, sprinkle a little information on the page that looks looks really cool because it looks old i am um, i i kind of felt that i do want to i 
not to undersell Jonathan Hickman, but these pages worked so much better for me because I have um, some memory loss issues and like having smaller bite sized things, but also having a very distinct like feeling that really helped with the book was awesome. And like these, these pages were like, the rest of the book was awesome, but these are the ones that were like, yes, please, I need more of this yeah, in my comics. I- I'm excited to hear that um, because you're really, um, well, you've already read issue two, so hopefully you enjoyed that yes. page. Um, but yeah, and also just having that in mind too, because um, another thing with this, with Newbie Ending Amazons, um, you know, I'm somebody who absolutely loves when s- someone who has never read comics before is like, I'm going to read this comic because I already know how daunting comics can feel anyway, um, especially mm-hmm. uh, comics from the bigger two because of the long the long history for a lot of a lot of these characters and just, just all of the books. So keeping all of that in mind, I wanted to make sure the series and definitely the first book felt like something that if you were a new reader, either to comics or Wonder Woman mythos or any of that, like you felt welcomed. Um, and there were little things that um, could just help you better digest the book. Um, so that honestly really makes me happy to hear because um you know, comics should be accessible. And I don't mean just in the ways that you get them, but also, mm-hmm. um, you know, they should still be welcoming to newer readers. Yeah. And one of our one of our writers for the site asked me to talk about them as well. Like, these pages, I, again, loved all of it, but like having these things and these kind of resources in books that are number ones are so helpful. Like, I feel comfortable giving this to a new reader and be like, hey, you're going to love this. Um, before I have a couple more, but I do want to ask you th- this may just be personal for me, but how did it feel when you saw the Sway variant cover? Oh my God. I, uh, I think I dropped my phone because <laughs> <laughs> I think the message came. No, actually, before I even got the message um, from our editor, Brittany, um, Sway had actually DM me um, the finished variant. And I was like, wait, what? My phone dropped. I also immediately downloaded it because I was like, this is going to be the background of my phone till forever. Um, Just beautiful. And like, I had saw that he was working on it um, and we had learned that he was going to be doing a variant cover. I just... I just got chills because I've been such a fan of his work. And that's another thing. (laughs) It has been so cool to kind of be be in the space with a lot of artists and writers whose work I've admired for so long and then actually get to, to work with them on some, some level. Yeah. I, uh, once I think it was like the vault covers Sway. Like when I started seeing Sway's art on like real things, I was like, Oh my God. Yes. Please. more. So when I saw this, like, again, I think my phone may have dropped as well. Their (laughs) art is like unbelievable, Uh, especially the Lady Gaga stuff, which I'm a huge fan of. Yes. Um, Ooh, I want to see a, and I hope that um, Sway does this, but a redraw of her bulk uh, stuff that just dropped today. Yeah, uh, yeah, he tweeted, he retweeted it with, um, it's like, I think it's Kermit the Frog praying. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I just, I'm just so excited to see all these new artists like on books with writers who I'm excited to see do more. So, um, very excited. So. I do want to talk about something Nubia says in issue one. Mm -hmm. She says that my first piece of armor has always been my chosen name and new arrivals are shown revealing their chosen names and kind of ceremony later. Can you elaborate on the power of one's chosen name in Damascara and just in life in general? Absolutely. Um, So just starting with life in general, uh, just for uh, black folks, I have a, my grandfather, um, Changed his entire name. I didn't learn that until I was older, but um, just stories of him and older relatives doing that um, either to new identities to move away from whatever they were trying to move away from. And then also just trying to forge um, just new lives um, and kind of like physically getting um, letting go of some of that baggage from um, their ancestors and the and the names that they were given when they were brought over here. So um, that's one aspect. And also um, just listening to a lot of trans people and when they pick their new names, um, the power that that holds. Um, and even just thinking of 
you know, my own name and, um, you know, having to grow to, to love it and sometimes wishing I would have gotten to also choose my own name. Uh, and then for the Themyscarans, it's the same thing. Um, cause it kind of felt like, again, like you are being reborn. So you get a chance to, you get to name yourself. Um, you are claiming a new life. And I know for Nubia specifically, uh, one of the things that I will often hear was, you know, folks would talk about her name. Like, why would they name her Nubia? Um, which, yeah, sure. I also kind of agree with at the time, but I was like, how can I subvert that? Like, how can I, how can I kind of change the thinking of that? And to give her uh, more agency and it's that she chose that name. It was hers. Um, so that was just kind of my way of giving this character back some of the agency that she has lost, um, you know, through the decades by just simply not being around. So uh, after when the new Themyscarans choose their names, Magala has this like, this like basket of trinkets kind of that are (laughs) from the regular world. Mm -hmm. Um, For you, did that like, was that like a metaphor for something? What, what was that? So the thinking behind that um, actually came from Young Diana, which I highly uh, like recommend to anybody to read because a lot of um, uh, kind of the storytelling inspiration um, as far as like what direction to take characters came from Young Diana. Uh, Because I really love what Jordi and them were doing as far as like reintroducing us to the mascara. But um, there was... A story with uh, Diana and Magala, and Magala is like showing her the Well of Souls, and they have like this cute moment because Diana's this inquisitive child. Magala's this uh, this Amazon that is like no um, no other because she's so much older, um, and it's because she's been by the well. Because again, different things on the island change folks when they're exposed to them for a long time. So. I thought um, just to kind of make the world feel more lived in if what when so what if when Diana got older and she finally left whenever she would come back she would bring Magala little trinkets from man's world um, because Magala you know just you know she doesn't want to leave like she enjoys her job and she's dedicated to the well so to kind of show Magala some of the uh, bring back some of the stuff from the from man's world because I just felt like that was something that she would probably be interested in so that whenever the well opened back up, possibly, um, because remember, like, these women are alive for a long time. So they got a lot of time to think. Um, So in her thinking of new ways to make the new uh, Amazons feel welcome, if they ever came out the well again, um, is to share a trinket from um, Man's World with them from uh, Diana, because essentially, like, Diana would be bringing this back because it made her happy, and she felt like it would make Magala happy, and hopefully Magala Magla is thinking that hopefully it would um, make the new Amazons feel feel welcome. Like there is no resentment towards man's world. Yeah. We're happy we're here. You're here. That's so interesting. And I I I think I actually have the Jordy book in this one room package I have over here. Mm-hmm. Um, super cool that she's doing all this writing now too, along yes. with being one of the best colorists out there. No. Um. Young Diana is the, it's been backups in Wonder Woman, right? Yes. And uh, okay. the collection of there stories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's beautiful. Yes, um, it is. The colors are immaculate. The story is just, I tell Jordy all the time, just like, thank you for writing this. Cause I don't know if you knew this and I didn't either, but it's just been so helpful. It's just a really great yeah. read. Yeah, and it's good. It again, it you could give it to younger audiences, which is super mm-hmm. important. Um, before I ask you something n- not Nubia and Wonder Woman related, how does it feel being a part of like I don't want to say like a new age of like we're getting the first Wonder Woman world event in I think it's over 20 years yeah it's something wild long yes yeah way too long for one of the <laughs> trinity right um but it it's fine things are we're working towards dc has put in a lot of work recently to do a lot of great things so mm-hmm. i'm very appreciative of that. like what does it feel like for you for like you're you're a part of this um 
because I'm in the thick of it, of course, you know, exciting, cool, yeah. all these other things. But I think when I look back on this time, um, I think that will that will be when it really hits me. Because, you know, like I love going back older comics. So seeing those different like seeing how things were like seated leading up to an event like Secret Wars or mm. leading up to, um, you know, Infinity Crisis and things like that. So I don't know, like I'm. I think I'm I'm excited about that in a retrospective way, uh, because my hope is that, you know, through everything that we're currently doing and with Trial of the Amazons, that it catapults all of these characters into a stratosphere that they've deserved to be in for a very long time. Like, I want more Wonder Woman animated uh, movies, uh, definitely a TV show because we haven't like an animated TV show. Diana definitely deserves one. Um, yeah. and like, I just want more, I want more stuff, like stuff with the Bonamigdal, um, Artemis, uh, Antiope, like this, cause I imagine her being like this cranky older sister that is just like done, um, uh, with her younger sister and what she's done and what she's doing or whatever. But like, I want to see all of these things and I want more writers to like, just, I don't know, like feel welcomed and excited to mm-hmm. hopefully play in this world. Yeah. It's so I have, I, admittedly, I haven't been like, I've never really followed a Wonder Woman series. Probably, I read a little bit of the New Fifty Two stuff, but it's like, it's never felt like something that's easy to get into because like, so much going on, like so much history. But like, with the start of Rebirth and these runs, it's like this is the perfect time to like be a huge fan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, I was very excited when this book like was announced, and I was like, oh, I'm so excited for this. And then I read it, and I was like. Yes, I don't have to like have all this background knowledge because it's right there. So, my my final question before our big finale, um, when I was reading your DC article, I've been, come to back to this a couple times just because like it always excites me when I see writers write for the official sites. So, <laughs> um, and your voice in your writing always makes me smile because there's like your humor is there. So. In that one, you said the superhero genre is at its best when we imagine what a good and what good and harm humanity can do in worlds which aliens can grow up to be Superman and Batman. You yourself have done a webcomic, but what if though, that is like this wonderful webcomic that explores what characters do between panels, so it's kind of these human mundane moments with like Batman, you've got characters from Marvel, I think I read a Power Ranger one earlier. I want to know what types of stories interest you most in these capes world. Uh, It's the ones where um, someone still decides to continuously get up and do the thing. Um, And sometimes a thankless job because not all heroes are on the same scale as, you know, a Tony Stark or a captain, um, (laughs) captain Steve Rogers or a Superman or even a Batman. Um, you have some of you, I guess, what you would consider like your, your B level, C level, but they still get up and do the thing. Um, you know, the fact that Spider-Man still goes out and risks his life (laughs) while still barely being able to pay his bills. Um, that is something that sounds completely insane, but it's not because there are so many of us who do that, right? Like we, Mm -hmm. we have to make, uh, we (laughs) have to like make things work and sometimes do work jobs and stuff that we don't want to. Um, so when we have a moment where we're able to do something that gives us fulfillment or purpose, it means something like you still get up so that you could pop, hopefully be able to do that thing. Um, so that's something that interests me. Um, Characters like, uh, like again, like a T'Challa, um, where he is king, but also at the same time feels this this drive and this desire to go gallivanting around with the Fantastic Four. Like he, he invites them out um, to come to Wakanda just to whoop up on them and then say, "Hey, can I be your superhero friend?" Like that is fascinating to me because like why like why would that character want to be that way and the only way to kind of explore that is what are these little things um like what does he do uh when it comes to going to the grocery store and he has to look for kimchi with um monica lynn uh i don't know like all those things um kind of remind you that even though these people are super like literally super um that does not take away from them still being 
very much human, even the aliens, because <laughs> there's no one more human uh, than Clark. And it shows yes. in the way that he has been brought up and still decided that he wants to be Earth's protector. That's, I love getting to hear writers talk about like what they like in comics. So <clears throat> that, I'm glad that's where you're at. Also, I would I would kill to see you write Spider Man one day. Just oh, trust me, that, I, I want to. Um, putting that out into the ether. Yeah, if Marvel could do a thing where they had like something similar, very similar to a Black Label, so I can get away with Spider like Peter having an OnlyFans, then yes, <laughs> I'm in. You know what? One hundred percent, it would be him. Like yes, it makes all this is he. He's yeah. already a photographer. He's got the skill. He has the powers that will allow him to take photos from you know different angles. angles. Also, I mean, have you have you read a Spider Man book? Because if you have, he Peter's already got the shots. So I there am, you have it. <laughs> there's only been so I <laughs> I was doing an interview a couple weeks ago with uh, Brandon Thomas. We were talking about um, Aquaman. And how that book is kind of, um, you know, hornier than most mm -hmm. stories you've read recently. <laughs> and we got to talk about how Todd, the, the Todd, made um, Spider-Man a pretty, um, you know, horny book. So, Oh, yes. That is my favorite. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's the only time I thought DC was going to shut me down. Um, but this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. But I do have to hit you with a hard one at the end. If you had a Rube Goldberg machine, what would it do? Um, oh, it would cut the light off above the microwave because we always leave it on and we should not be leaving it on. Like a like you have one above? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Or I have like a backup. Um, one that will wake my son up in the morning when it's time for school. I, wanna you know, be, I, I, I want it to be as inconvenient as possible. <laughs> I've not had experience that yet, um, but I do know how I was, so yeah. I very much empathize <laughs> with you. Um, but seriously, thank you so much for coming. I've been super excited to finally talk with you. Um, where can people find you? What should they be picking up? Uh, you can find me in uh, the subreddit about how to make your own Pokemon. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not there. <laughs> you can find me on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Steph underscore I underscore Will. Um, check out whystuff.com. And I don't know. Just stay on the lookout because um, I'm writing things. Good to hear. I think you're the first TikTok plug we've had, actually. Yeah. Well, I, own, I know. I got I like that. I got bullied into being on there. It's, it's, it's cute. It's a nice app. Listen, if anyone deserves to be on there, it's you. Because yeah, the I memes, can't get suspended. Oh, I didn't even ask about the Green Goblin's ass. It's fine. Oh, dang. Um, <laughs> we'll come back after the movie. You can find us at GayCrashers.fan and on all social media at GayCrashersPod. I did it right that time. Um, thanks. I look forward to talking to you again. Oh, my God.